good news you haven't yet, we want to welcome you. So we're so glad that you're here on a beautiful day the Lord has given us. Just a few things. Happy Grandparents Day. I don't know if you didn't know that. Hallmark does. And so we want to make sure that we want to thank all you grandparents out there and hope you have a, a great day. Don't forget following the service downstairs. We have a wonderful class downstairs for the adults. Plus we have things for the kids as well. On Wednesday, 412 meets at 6 o'clock. That's for our junior, senior high. They meet downstairs, have some eat, and then they have a lesson. Uh, kick. Is for our younger kids, that starts at 6.30 on Wednesday. Also for the adults, we are now in the book of James. What a tremendous book on just how to live a mature Christian life. Great discussions, great things we invite. I just would just love to have everybody here just enjoying that as we get closer and closer of how we need to be as, as Christians. Also, I know today I think is a deadline for anybody who wants to go to the Apple Orchard. This is, and I know it's kind of a youth thing, but we're taking anybody who wants to go. We got that van, we'd like more than happy to fill it up, go get a bunch of apples and apple cider and donuts and do all these fun things. So this has to be today or talk to, to Shelby to make sure she, she knows that. Also, like I said before, on October 27, 5 o'clock, we want to take a bunch of people to the Red Wings game. I mentioned that last week that when uh, we went, a group of us, they're doing again, it's a celebration of faith. We got to go early, got a tour, set up a block of tickets, and then I got the call that she said, man, it was when it was the, to bring all the churches in to look at this as they promoted the idea, just packed the place, and they sold out all the tickets that they had for this. And she said, because of that, we're going to bump you. You know, we had the 49 seats, not the lower bowl, $69 seats. But she says, because of that, you're the first ones, we're going to put you in the lower bowl, the $69 seats for $49. So not only get a discount anyways for going, but now we're getting an added discount for better seats at the same price. So you Red Wing fans or whatever, get into that. We want to take the church bus, maybe get a caravan. Church will pay for parking, so you don't have to pay for anything but buying me hot dogs. That's it. That's <laughs> all. Eight, nine dogs, and you know I'm going to be good. So, you know, I know watching uh, the hockey game, so every quarter that, you know, I'm waiting for somebody to go, they play periods. I know. <laughs> Just want to know if you knew. So, you know we had finished a series called Contend for the Faith. And the reason we did this kind of gave us the why. We gave the answers on why we need to contend for the faith. We gave and we talked about the different things that we need to know to be able to contend for the faith. We're going to start a new series here on how do we do that. How do we contend. We know why, but how do we do this? And so the new series that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks is called The Fruit of the Spirit. And today we're going to be talking about the power of powerful patience. And if you'd like to follow along, it's going to be in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 26. We know that Christians come in all different kind of shapes and sizes, different backgrounds, diff and it's difficult sometimes for just everybody to get along. Patience is the spirit-given quality that helps fit everyone together into a church that wants to praise God. Let me ask you this question. How many of you people like to put together jigsaw puzzles. I don't know if anybody else, man, I love jigsaw puzzles. I love doing these. Um, my wife and I, we don't. <laughs> we have enough frustration when we work together sometimes that we don't need to go to a store and buy a box of frustration. We can create our own anyways. So that's not like a big thing. It's not like, hey, let's go do a puzzle. No, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> But as I was researching, I did find this article that was pretty interesting. It said, everything I need to know about life, I learned from jigsaw puzzles. It said, first of all, you need to establish the border first. Boundaries give us a sense of security and order. Number two, when things aren't going so well, just take a break. Sometimes things look a little bit better if you just walk away and then come back. Sometimes you just want to keep walking. 
but sometimes you return things look different. Number three, it says working together with friends and family makes any task a little bit quicker and sometimes a little bit more fun. Number four, the creator of the puzzle gave you the picture as a guidebook. There it is. Number five, don't force a fit. That's why I probably was never really good at puzzles. I'm going to make my own. And sometimes it doesn't work that way. If something's not meant to be, it'll eventually come together naturally. Perseverance pays off. Every puzzle goes together bit by bit and piece by piece. Anything we're doing sometimes takes some time and takes effort. And this is a great puzzle. Can't be rushed. One of the things that seems to be repeated in these observations is when you put a puzzle together, it's important to understand patience is the key. Unless you're putting together one of those children puzzles or whatever, you'll probably get that done. Really but there are some puzzles that take a long time. Those who've done those 500, 1,000, 10,000, I don't know how high it goes up to. It can get pretty crazy. I was looking at a few of these and I go, that would be kind of hard to do. Or that one. Or even that one would probably drive me completely... No, I don't know if I want that. I know that the, my greatest achievement in doing a puzzle, I did one in two months, and I was excited because on the box it said two to three years. <laughs> yeah, I think about that one for a minute. <laughs> but if you're not patient, you may end up trying to force pieces together where they don't belong. You might find yourself being increasingly unhappy even when you make a little bit of progress and things aren't going that way. When you get to the point you just want to take it, put it all together, tear it up, put it in the box, and throw the box away. But we have to understand patience is the key. And in the book of Galatians, God tells us that one of the most noticeable marks of a spirit led Christian is patience. A mature Christian is a patient Christian. And it's part of that fruit of the Spirit. And the less patient you are sometimes, maybe the less mature you are in Jesus Christ. Now God isn't talking here, and it's not in Galatians, not talking about that level of patience that you might have just putting a jigsaw puzzle together. Nor the patience that we have to wait at the grocery store, or maybe the post office, or how many times you've had to call the cable company, and you put on hold, and that song just keeps going over and over again, and then a little voice comes in, you know, someone will get with you as soon as, yeah, whatever. Or you're punching buttons. You can't get a real person. All I want to do is talk to somebody. And usually, you know, punch one, and hit one, hit two, and I'm just hitting them all. <laughs> Somebody's got to get on here. How many times, you know, it's not talking about having patience when you're just nice and easy driving down the road, probably four or five miles under the speed limit, and some jerk cuts you off and almost cut, you know. We're not talking about that. How many people hate just go to the doctor's office and to wait sometimes. I don't if you know, I am on the board at Community First Medical Center. Been on it for, for a while the past year. I was the, the president of the board. And one of the things we wanted to do is try to expedite the, the whole process. I'll try to eliminate waiting. And what happens is you almost get to the point, it's kind of like you're running into maybe an assembly line and people aren't communicating with each other, and sometimes it even makes the process longer. I remember that that was one of our goals, to try to make this done quicker, and it almost backfired in our face. It was right around this time to see everybody's coming and getting their flu shots, getting uh, you know, shingle shots, and there's hepatitis shots, there's, there's all these different shots you can get, and we offer them at Community First. Well, a man did come in, waited in line, finally gets to the front desk, and she said, of course, can I help you? And she says, well, how can I help you? He says, well, I have shingles. 
He says, well, here, sit down. And it was a, maybe a stack of papers he had to fill out, insurance papers, consent forms, papers that say you signed papers and all these different, and he did. And about 15 minutes later, he hands the paper in and he waits. And another person, a nurse's aide comes in and says, you know, come to the back here. And he says, problem? He said, shingles. So she took his weight, complete medical history. So he, you know, without really asking, gave him a shingle shot. <laughs> and he just sat there, all right. She says, I'm going to put you in this other room. So he sat there for a while. And another nurse came in. <laughs> what are you here for? Shingles. <laughs> so she gave him a blood test. Ready to give him another shingle shot. I got that already, ma'am. Thank you very much. Told him to take all his clothes off and just wait. The doctor will be with him in a minute. Well, about a half hour later, the doctor does walk in the room and said, what do you have? And he said, shingles. <laughs> and the doctor looks and says, where? I can't find them. He said, I have them in my truck outside. <laughs> where do you want me to put them? <laughs> now, I don't know if that's smart or if that's just patience. <laughs> But sometimes we all have to be patient in different kinds of situations. I'm always patient in all kinds of situations. Lord, don't strike me down now. Because <laughs> that's sometimes, there's certain things that get frustrating. There's certain things that sometimes it's very hard. But as important it is, we have to be patient. It's an important call. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. This is what God wants us to do. This is what God desires of us. In Galatians, God is telling us that we must be patient with our Christian brothers and sisters. The church that Paul writes in Galatians had some pretty serious problems, one of which they were people in the church who just didn't get along. If we read in Galatians 5.15, it says, If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. He had to write them and say, Hey, keep this up. It's not going to be good. There are people in that church who engage in backbiting and sniping at each other. They might not have done this in their face, but they were talking bad about each other, you know, probably behind their backs. But the point remains, Paul knew that they are trying to devour each other. And Paul tells them, you have a choice to make, as he tells the church in Galatians. He said, one, you could be led by God's Spirit. Two, they could wallow in sinful behaviors of the flesh. Then Paul goes on and describes these sinful behaviors, because he said, seriously, are you guys not seeing this? It is so obvious what's going on here in this church. And as we read in Galatians, he said, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, fractions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He could go on and on. It's almost like, do you need me to continue on? what's going on in the problems, but I love what he puts here at the end. He says, I warn you, as I did before, this ain't the first warning shot over your people's head, as I warned you before, that those who live like this will not, cannot, won't happen inherit the kingdom of God. The church had problems. Problems like sexual immorality, drunkenness. They had problems with infighting, hatred, discord dissension, fractions. And he said he warned them before about this behavior. But then Paul goes into detail on how being led by the Spirit is entirely a different proposition. If you're led by the Spirit, you're going to see something completely different. This is the part we're talking about. We contend for the Spirit, but now we need to know how do we do these things. And he talks about the fact that a church ought to have these things. It should have love. It should have joy. It should have peace. It should have patience, kindness. And that list goes on and on. Paul describes that every church really knows what it should have inside that church. A church that is a place where people love one another. A church where they can work at creating an atmosphere of 
joy. A church where they promote peace amongst each other. A church where they're patient with one another. This morning I want to focus on the need to be patient as one of the fruits of the Spirit. And kind of give you a little Greek lesson. The Greek word makrothumai actually means slow to anger. Macro meaning slow, thumus meaning anger. If you read the King James Version, it doesn't call it patience, it calls it long suffering. I recently read a story about a little kindergartner and the teacher, and the kindergarten teacher was helping this child get its boots on. It was winter, it's cold, and she just struggles doing this. She works at it, and she works at it, and she finally manages to get the boots on this little boy. And the little boy looked at her and goes, I think my boots are on the wrong foot. And she looked and said, yes, you're right. So she struggles to get them off, and she pulls and tugs, and she gets them off, puts them right, puts them back on with the same struggle. And the little boy looks and goes, these aren't my boots. <laughs> so, I, so she took them off, struggled, did all these things, and when she got them off, the little boy looked at her and goes, they're my brother's boots. My mother told me to wear those today. <laughs> Not knowing to cry or laugh. <laughs> she says, okay. So she struggles and she gets them back on. Sweating's coming off her a little bit. And she goes, there. Where's your mittens? I put them in the toe of my boots. <laughs> now, that is long-suffering. This is patience in the presence of repeated frustration. And why was that teacher willing to show some patience? Because you know, in her mind, she was doing this. But yet she showed patience. Because the little boy was just in kindergarten. He didn't know any better. He wasn't doing this on purpose. He wasn't being rebellious. He wasn't being mean-spirited. He was just being immature. In the church, you're going to find a lot of people who are new Christians, who are new in their faith, who are immature in their faith. And we need to take the time to make sure that we show them. Unless, and sometimes it can happen, unless they're being mean-spirited, unless they're really trying to cause some kind of rebellion within the church, God tells us we need to be patient with them. But if they are mean-spirited, if they are causing rebellion, if they are doing things, then it does call for the church what I call a biblical intervention. And you're going, well, who does this biblical intervention? Well, I'm going to, first of all, it's usually the church elders. They need to see this. The church leadership, the deacons, those, a Bob Poole. Some of these people have been here for quite a while see these things. And it's important that we understand that. God puts this in the hands of our leadership. But even when they correct members of the church, elders must be very gentle. And they must show patience. And you're going, why? Because the church is made up of different kinds of people. They have many different backgrounds. Many people have different degrees of faith. Ephesians tells us, please be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you're called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. You see, God's objective is to take people from different walks of life. People, like us, at some point in our life, struggle with so many different kinds of things, who struggle with so many different kinds of sins. Then it's our job to take these people as Christians through love and through patience and show them the way. And let them find Jesus Christ. Allow them to be saved. And then join them together 
just like pieces of a puzzle. God's goal is to take these people, various shapes and sizes and backgrounds, and fit them together to form a glorious picture of unity that can impress the most jaded skeptic or critic that's out there. And they'll see that. They'll see the change. Because we, as Christians, do things with patience. And we do them with love. Ephesians 4 tells us, Speak the truth in love. We will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head. That is Jesus Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now the problem is patience doesn't naturally just come to most of us. Galatians says that true patience comes by allowing the Spirit of God to control us. If we walk in the Spirit of God, we will eventually become a person of patience. But we need to walk in the Spirit of God. We need to put God into our hearts. As Galatians tells us, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step within the Spirit. If I'm going to be a patient person, God wants me then to be able to train within myself. It doesn't come easy. So how does God's Spirit train us to be patient? How does that happen? First, God does so by reminding us that he had to be patient with us first. So many times we forget that, of who we were and where we came from, and the patience that God had with us. Paul writes, in Colossians, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, close yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. The Spirit reminds us that the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience. That's what leads to repentance. The Bible tells me that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So what I want to do right now is have a quiz. <laughs> it's time. Maybe it's just because I miss teaching or something, which I don't. But, <laughs> I mean, oh, um, I just thought I'd throw that out there. So, here we go. Since the Bible tells us that we've all have sinned and have all fallen short of God's glory, here's the question. You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you are imperfect people? Now, I know Diane LaCarrie's not here. I hope she's... I'm going to look at the camera over here. She says she's going to listen to sermons. I know, Diane, you'd say, no, that ain't me. <laughs> but for the rest of us, you're just saying, well, okay. Yes, I am. I don't need everybody to stand up. I don't need people to raise hands. We all know we've fallen short. We all know that we are imperfect people. But God, God has been patient with you. God has been patient with me. If he weren't patient with us, none of us would stand a chance. None of us. But he is. And we need to understand that. Because God loves us and is patient with us, he forgives us even though we've sinned. That's when people in church start to irritate us. We become a little bit annoyed or we get rubbed the wrong way. We need to imitate God. As it says in Colossians, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's the spirit we need to have. To have a great weight at your heart. Sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes it's very difficult to understand what we need to do. Sometimes it's difficult to see what we have to see. And as Christians, we need to make sure we forgive each other. Sometimes we get so frustrated, so annoyed with what's going on that it's very difficult to handle these things. We don't want to wait on God to bring about those changes. We want those changes to happen 
now. We want those changes to make sure that they're in our heart and to understand that. But sometimes we want to do it on our own. We want to fix all the problems. We want to fix the things that we think need to be fixed. And as Jesus said, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly remove the speck from your own brother's eye. And it's important that we understand that. We need to examine our hearts. We need to look into our hearts first. And when we look into our hearts, make sure that the reason is we're looking or pointing or trying to, to correct out of love is that we're not being self-righteous, that we're not being judgmental, that we're not being arrogant in how we do these things. You see, Jesus understood that. Jesus was the one who showed us what patience is all about. Jesus came here and showed us how to live. And you know the patience that that man had to have. The patience when he came here as a baby in 30 years, the patience of probably biting at the bit, saying, I'm ready, I'm ready, let me loose. Not yet. The patience he had as he walked for three years and preached, and looking at some of them, they just, you're not getting it. But he still showed love. And he still showed forgiveness. The patience that he had was Satan. As he's being tempted in the wilderness, knowing that he could end that game at any time. The patience he had with the ruling body. As he accused him of these things. The patience he had with Pontius Pilate. When he said, I can let you go. No, you don't understand. The patience of, of carrying that cross for us, to die for us. We need to understand, as he said, though, it's not an excuse sometimes. If we do see somebody doing something wrong, it's not saying, you know, hey, we don't have to get everybody involved. But he does say, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their faults. And just between the two of you, if they listen to you, you have won them over. You see, Jesus says, what do you need to do first before you talk to your brother as you do it in love? You examine your heart first. You go to them. You talk to them. And it's important that we understand that. I love this church. And I'm not talking about these are the problems we have in this church because we don't. This church is so full of love. This church is so welcoming. This church goes out of its way to do so many great things that it's hard to explain all the great things that this church does. But we've got to look at something different. I'm going to ask you here today to do something. A vow, if you want to call it. But I want you to just, within your own heart, to think about this. That the next time somebody irritates you, the next time somebody says something, that your vow is, I'm going to go to that person. I'm going to go talk to that person out of love. I'm going to go talk to that person because I have a forgiveness and I've been forgiven. I want to put it into our prayers that I pray every day for wisdom. I pray that I have a forgiving heart. I pray that I can be Christ-like in my dealing with people. That if there's somebody out there, it's not that I want to point and say, oh, you better change. It's, hey, I love you and your family. And we need to sometimes fix the little things. And we need to look at each other that way. To be willing to help. To be willing to go and just say, hey, what can I do to help? That's what Christ is asking us to do. He tells us we must run with endurance. And I love that. That we need to run with that endurance. You know, it's hard sometimes. Some people think that when we talk about patience, it's just sitting back and just, okay, I'm just going to sit back, lay down, put it on hold, let things happen. And doing that, that's good. But sometimes there's more to it. There's a greater strength that we can have with patience. 
Sometimes when we have that great weight upon us, on our heart, we still need to run. To have a deep anguish in your spirit and knowing that your heart is hurting and you don't know what to do and sometimes you just want to lash out and do these things. You can't. The hard part is you're still going to perform your daily task. Your daily task of loving. Your daily task of forgiving. Your daily task of showing humility because that's a Christ-like thing. The hardest thing that most of us are called to exercise is our patience. Not lying down, but going out into the street. To be patient with those who need help. To ask people, maybe to come to church. Or just to sit and talk. To look into their eyes and see these things. And it's important that we do these things. The thing that usually enters my mind during communion And thank you again, Mark, for for a wonderful job and all the men that come up here and do such a tremendous job. My thought always goes to Jesus' eyes during that last night, the last supper. My thoughts go to see these eyes as he walks in and he washes the disciples' feet. As he looked up into them, what were those eyes saying? I see his eyes are just saying how much I love you, how much patience I have for you. I see as he sits at the table, he breaks that bread, and he gives them the wine, and just his eyes, so full of love, so full of compassion. As he's in the garden praying, just say, please play for me, and he don't, but I just see his eyes with tears in them. Because of the love that he has for us, the patience that he has for us. I see when he's arrested, and all these false accusations, and I just see in his eyes, this has to be done. This is what needs to be done. Not lashing out, but accepting what I have to do because that's what's going to change the hearts and the lives of people. The eyes of patience, the eyes of forgiveness. And it's important that we do this. To wait sometimes is very, very difficult. But to do it with good courage, sometimes it's even harder. You see, God's objective is to take people who come in many shapes and sizes and fits us all together in one body for his glory. That's what God wants to see. Who don't care who you are, where you came from. We want to bring you together as one big family so we can honor who Jesus, so we can give God all the glory. You know, there's a story uh, about a dad who had been working hard and came home and was extremely tired that night and so he sits down and just can't wait to get the newspaper out and just wants to sit on the couch stare at the fireplace he says I don't even care if there's a fire in it or not I just I just want to relax and as soon as he gets comfortable the son comes running up daddy 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 can we play can we play can we play can we play and he's going I don't want to disappoint my son and he doesn't know what to do he's so tired and he looks at the paper There was a huge article on the front page about the Earth and the moon, you know, this new space mission and the weather and stuff, and it was like one big picture of the Earth on the front page. And he said, son, go give me the scissors. And so his son brought him scissors. He says, I want to do something. He said, what, Dad, what, Dad? And so he took it and he cut all little pieces. And he says, I made a puzzle for you. I want you to go to your room, get some tape. When you tape puzzle is complete, come and we'll play. And the dad said, I got at least 45 minutes now. <laughs> I can just relax. About seven minutes later, the boy comes running. I'm all done, Dad. I'm all done. He goes, whew, that was pretty fast. He said, how did you do? He said, Dad, it was easy. And the boy turned the picture of the earth over, and there was a picture of a man. And he said, Dad, it was so easy because when you put the man together, the world came together. And how true that is, as I call Pam back up here, as we get ready to close today, that's our goal, is to put people together in the church in such a way that we build the kind of congregation God wants us to build. And it's so important. This is just a building, but we come together because that's what God asks us to do. We come together because God is saying, as a family, we need to come together 
and work with each other in love with each other. And if there's a problem, we handle those problems because we have to. Because that's what the scripture tells us to do. This is what this congregation was built to do. This is a congregation that is a Bible-based congregation. We believe in the sanctity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that if you're a sinner, if you repent of your sins and confess those sins and get baptized in those waters right there and they're ready, as always, that he says, I'm going to give you a new life. I promise you eternity. And when we get that new life, he says, as a church, a congregation coming together, sharing with each other, having patience with each other, loving each other, it's amazing what can be done when we come together as a congregation to see the needs of those who need help, to pat somebody in the back when they did something good, to be there as you would as a family, as Christ is there for us. We need to be that church. We need to be a church that's not always going to contend for the faith, but we need to be a church that is a praise and that it proclaims the power of God. If you're suffering, if you need help, if you have questions, this is what we're here for. There's people that will talk to you. There are people that will pray for you. I wish I had that mind where I could read yours and be able to just step in. But sometimes you need to say, I need help. And there's a lot of you out there who help all the time, and when you need help, you don't have to because it's not who you are. But sometimes, yes, it is who you are. Let the family help. Let Jesus, through us, help. As we grow in Jesus Christ, we're here to help. That's why we have a Sunday school. That's why we do Wednesday night. That's why we do these things, because we want you to grow in the Spirit, to develop that fruit of the Spirit. That's what a church is all about. Not just showing up here, but showing up in each other's lives. To be able to help and to love and to hold. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear precious Heavenly Father, you are so amazing. Your power is so awesome that we can't even comprehend it. But we're okay with that because we know you love us. We sit here as sinners knowing that you forgive us and we thank you so much for that. But we ask because of that, we ask for wisdom, dear Heavenly Father. We ask for strength. We ask for courage. As we sit here as a congregation, let us not be judgmental, but let us come together as one. Let this church go like it's never grown before in your name and giving you the glory, dear Heavenly Father. Grant us the patience to see the things we need to see. Grant us the patience to hear the things that we need to hear. Grant us the patience to have the strength to step back sometimes and the patience to take that step forward. We just thank you so much that we can be here. Continue to watch us, protect us, and be with us. It's your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Another powerful message. How do you know I needed that again, you know? It's like, wow. <laughs> um, so, I hope everyone had a first uh, week or weeks back to school. You know, like John says, there's many opportunities to learn. That's awesome, you know. That's what I always <laughs> say to people. Uh, some prayer requests here, Amy Benedict. Uh, as you're aware, on behalf of Clayton Taylor, we've been praying for. Uh, we have been, uh, Clayton uh, collapsed up north, as we saw the message uh, within the past week. Uh, he was taken to St. John Moross. He did have a stroke, uh, and the carotid artery was completely blocked. They put a stint in, and he is uh, home, but a, a long recovery is ahead of him. Uh, the doctor said his survival was a miracle and gives prayers uh, the credit, which is awesome. Uh, but unfortunately, he was a caretaker for his mother, who is housebound and needs prayer. She lives alone and counts on Clayton uh, to help her, and, sh and he just can't right now. So another need there. Uh, so on behalf of Carol's friend, uh, Nancy Leparle, uh, some of you are aware George Leparle passed away Friday night after a long battle with cancer. There'll be no funeral, 
Uh, she would love cards, uh, and we have her address if you, if you need that. On behalf of Michelle Kaiser, uh, please pray for Aria. She's having, uh, this is uh, a teething. She's going through a little rough uh, for Stephanie, obviously, as you're aware. Uh, remember those days. Uh, please be praying for Stephanie, Aria, and myself as we are learning tomorrow for a trip to go see the family in Ohio. Praying for safe travels as well as for all to stay healthy. Uh, also, please keep uh, her Aunt Mary in your prayers. She is in early stages of Alzheimer's. Uh, this is also on behalf of Michelle Kaiser for baby Logan Walker. Logan is in I NICU on a respirator. Uh, he was born 35... After 35 weeks, his mom, because his mom fell down the stairs, his lungs are weak and underdeveloped. Uh, his mom is on, uh, is the top of my upline in my jewelry business. So mom and dad's names are Ma Mandy and Justin Walker. So please keep that family in your prayers. On behalf of Austin Runyon, his grandparents, prayers that they have a safe uh, trip back to Florida. Uh, so that they can sell their home quickly there so they can move back to Michigan with their family. So please keep them in your prayers. Uh, on behalf of Gina's daily, her son John, just an ongoing thing with him. Uh, he has bladder issues, he's in a nursing home, and he's not getting the care he needs, uh, and he can't be moved at this time. So please keep them in your prayers. I know some of those nursing homes can be very challenging and very surreal. Uh, on behalf of uh, the family of Earl McCartney, as some of you are aware, uh, he continue to keep him in your prayers as the cancer is slowly spreading. Um, and just uh, keep him in your prayers for faith and strength. Uh, this is on behalf of Pam herself. Uh, just hives are horrible, which makes me uh, think that I'm stressing myself out. So just uh, please keep her in your prayers. Also, please keep Karen in your prayers as she's continuing to go through just a lot of pain right now. So just keep her for strength and perseverance. Also, I was just talking uh, some prayers. Someone that we've been praying for in St. Clair. Uh, it was a fundraiser, uh, friends, I think. To Steve Legro. Uh, as you're aware, he's just got a very strange cancer. He's not that old, and uh, he's not doing very well. It's just spreading like a wildfire, so um, it just can't do a whole lot much more for him. So just keep them in your family. And then also, I, just someone worked for me and just came up. I you know, got a text and said, hey, can you keep my uh, family in prayer? He's gone through a tough time. His girlfriend uh, went through and uh, found out at U of M that her one-year-old son had passed away this week. So I said, is there anything can do with just prayer is the only thing that can help. So it's so thankful that he reached out in that respect. So just a lot of hurting people and so forth. So just uh, remember these people, as you said, prayer is powerful. We do not have all the answers or understanding of what God's perfect answers are, but just remember uh, these people and, and take it serious. You don't have to go home and say an hour of prayer sometimes. Sometimes when somebody's praying for you, meditate or five minutes, hey, just bring it to God's attention. So anyone else I may have forgotten. All right, okay. Go with me in prayer, please. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we just come at this time, Father, realizing how weak, how imperfect we are as humans. But because we're members of your family, and that family is growing, that we need patience, Father. Help us to be loving and kind, Father, and look at, Father, our own hearts, as we do need that patience to go forth and intervene, Father. Let us focus in on the cross, because we can't love others if we don't focus in on Jesus Christ first. Father, we pray for those that we brought before you today. We pray that those that need physical healing, that you intervene on their behalf, that you work through their doctors, fathers, if needed, because you are the true healer. And Father, sometimes the answer may be no, and it's very humbling and we get frustrated and angry sometimes, but Father, we just ask that the greater glory be done, Father. 
Whatever your will is for these situations, we do not know, but we just ask that we can, those that surround these people, surround our, these families, maybe it's within our own homes, that we can be caring and loving and showing the, the great patience of Jesus Christ. And Father, we just pray also that those that may need safe travels, Father, and those that are suffering, Father, not only from a, a physical weakness, but maybe spiritually, maybe they're questioning if you really are, that they can, Father, ask one of these people here, or maybe outside these walls, that they, in your overall church, that the answers can be provided, that they can join the greater family, Father. That is your ultimate goal, is to grow the family of God. And Father, let us not forget this, as sometimes we are very impatient people, but remember to allow us to grow more and more, that we can see things through the eyes of Christ. And Father, that you just bless these people here, bless our travels, bless our families, Father. And let us go out, Father, to be lights this week. And we just give you all honor and glory in your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.